What's happening team? Today we're looking at portrait retouching and editing. Now on any given day, I retouch between five and 10 portraits and as many as 15 on a busy day. So I need a streamlined editing workflow. So here's an insight into how I retouch portraits from import straight through to delivery of the images to the client. I'll show you my physical setup, the software that I use, my editing techniques, and some of the tricks of the trade. Now, one of the best investments you'll ever make for editing of any kind is a graphics tablet. I use a Wacom Intuos Pro. Um, I've had this for about four years and it's still brilliant. Uh, it does use Bluetooth wireless connectivity, but I keep it hardwired directly into my Mac. Uh, so there is no delay from the pen inputs. Now these aren't essential for retouching, but they do speed up the workflow by about three or four times. So next up, I have a bog standard wireless keyboard and mouse. And next to the keyboard, I have a Loop Deck CT console. Now this is not essential for retouching, but it is extremely useful for creating keyboard shortcuts and Photoshop actions. And it's got a dedicated Lightroom profile. I'll go more into that as we go along. To import the images, I use Lightroom Classic and I use Affinity Photo and Photoshop consecutively for the retouching process. Let's begin. I'm pumped. So let's start off with this image of Lana. She's an actress and she came to see me about five or six weeks ago and she had the most big beautiful blue eyes. So I thought she'd be a prime candidate for this headshot retouching session. And I like to start off using my loop deck dials and my first dial is set to change the exposure. So I'm just gonna bring the exposure down by 0.10 and the highlights can come down to around, let's find a sweet spot, that's good around minus 12. Shadows, we can come up a bit to around plus 25, just to deal with the detail in the hair here. And the white slider we can bring up to around plus 20. And blacks will bring down for a bit more contrast around minus five. I'll probably push the blacks a bit further in Photoshop further in the process. And my final dial is the vibrant slider and we're just gonna bring that up to around plus 21 is good. And that's a good start. The texture and clarity sliders I tend to leave alone unless it's an older man with more features and laughter lines. So I like to push the clarity slider up just to give it a bit more essence there. Or if it's an older lady, I do the reverse and just bring the clarity and texture sliders down a bit. But because this is a young lady, I don't think we need to touch those sliders at all. And the background, I think we can just lighten up a bit using the luminance slider on the blue slider. Let's just bring that up to, all the way up to, let's try plus 50. And I think just there's a few bits of yellow in the image that are just distracting my eye. So let's just bring the saturation down by about negative 10. And I think we can bring those blues down in the background as well to negative 15. And that's it. I don't use any sharpening because the image is sharp enough and there's no noise reduction needed because we are at ISO 100 on the original file. And my loop deck has a shortcut button to open this up in Affinity Photo. So let's just press that and we'll edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. Okay, so that's opened up our image in Affinity Photo. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is make a copy of the background layer with Control or Command J, so we have a reference to the original image. And there's a number of reasons why I like to use Affinity Photo over Photoshop for this particular part of the process. And the first reason is the speed in which the program renders the image. It's so lightning fast compared to Photoshop. Um, the second reason is the inpainting brush tool which is similar to that of the uh, spot removal tool in Photoshop. Um, but the only difference is you actually have control over the opacity of this tool, but you don't in Photoshop. And the third reason is because of the dedicated frequency separation filter. Um, so we have this handy slider and we can see that the layer is separated into high frequency and low frequency. And that is the detail from the skin tones. And we use the radius slider to increase the detail on the high frequency layer and take away detail from the low frequency layer. That is frequency separation. 
Um, so we're going to choose about a radius of around five pixels should do it. Um, and it just starts to lose detail in the low frequency layer, which is where we want to be. So let's apply that. And we're going to also use an adjustment layer and it's a black and white layer, a default one. And then we're going to bring the red slider all the way down to negative 100. And what this does is allow us to see all of the blemishes very clearly. So if we take off the adjustment layer, you can see how much it increases the viewing capability of those blemishes. So we're going to use the low frequency layer to start and the healing brush tool. Opacity is 100%, flow 100%, and a hardness is down to zero. And then what we're going to do is just zoom in on an area of skin, and the brush tool size needs to be just bigger than the area we're going to be healing. And we take a sample using the control button on your keyboard, and we want to sample a clean area of skin as close to the blemish as possible. And we can see the skin tones start to even out. Now the skin texture still remains, but we're currently working on the low frequency layer. We'll tackle the texture of the high frequency once we've evened out all the skin tones. And sampling can take practice choosing the correct part of the skin, but using the Wacom tablet, we can cycle through this process fairly quickly once you've got the hang of it. And I'm pretty happy with this chin area, and as I've said, we'll come back to do a second pass focusing on the skin texture in a minute or two. So let's deal with the cheeks. And on the nose area, we do have some blown out specular highlights, which can often happen from either makeup or oily skin. So I'm going to sample a clean area of skin further afield and I'll just darken down those areas. Now this doesn't look particularly great at the moment, but bear with me, there's a trick up my sleeve in Photoshop further in the process. Now you'll notice that on her forehead here, we actually have some scars, and typically you don't want to get rid of scars unless you're instructed to by the client, but we can reduce those down ever so slightly, so we can take the opacity slider of the healing brush tool down to 50% and then we'll sample just next door to those areas and just cool them off ever so slightly. And we'll just get the eye here, there's a bit of a blemish there and on the eyelid just there. Okay, I think we can get rid of the black and white adjustment layer now. And we'll just zoom out and have a look. And that's looking pretty good. Now, the next thing I like to deal with is the eye bags. I didn't touch these up until this point. And I'll go back to the uh, low frequency layer and we'll just reduce down the opacity to around 40%. And then we'll choose a nice area of skin just underneath. And I'll just do a sweeping pass over the eye bag. Now 40% opacity is a sweet spot as we don't want to get rid of them altogether as this is a facial feature. The client still needs to look like their current headshot, not a younger version of themselves. So let's see the subtle difference of the eye bags with the history window. And as I've said, with older men and weathered faces, I do the opposite and enhance features like eye bags and laughter lines. Now let's go on to the high frequency layer and we'll deal with the texture now. So we're still on the healing brush tool. Uh, we're still at 100% opacity, 100% flow, but this time we're gonna bring up the hardness to around 85%. Because as you can see, the healing brush tool now has texture and we need this texture to extend to the extremities of the tool, not taper off. And again, we want to sample an area as close to the blemish as we can, and it does take some practice where you sample from, matching up the right sort of texture. You may get this wrong occasionally and have to try another sampled area. And of course, we have this troublesome area on the nose, so let's add back in some texture that was lost from those blown out highlights. Now the nose does look a little flat at this stage, but there is one more adjustment that I'm going to make in Photoshop to bring back the highlight on the nose in just a minute. 
and we'll tidy up the remaining dry bits of skin on the forehead. And we missed a little area of redness on the neck here. And I'm going to do one more 40% opacity adjustment on her laughter lines just to de-emphasize those. Back on the low frequency layer. And I think this little scar just above the eyelid. Once the frequency separation process is done, I like to stamp down the layers with Control, Alt, Shift and E, and then discard those layers. And here's a before and after. Looking good so far. So let's deal with these flyaway hairs, which you always get with girls especially. And we'll choose the inpainting brush tool, which I was telling you about. And I'm just removing these stragglers. This doesn't look good, but as I said before, the opacity can be reduced on this tool so you can spot remove gradually to feather the affected area. And I'll just speed up the video here while I remove any last remaining flyaway hairs. And that's Affinity Photo done with, the rest I finish in Photoshop. So let's export this file as a Photoshop file. And I'll pop it in the same source folder as the original raw file. And we can simply locate the file and open this up in Photoshop. Now I'm not quite happy with this section of hair on the left side. So using the clone stamp tool, let's see if we can sample a decent area and tidy things up. And there's a slight haloing effect happening, so we can sample the background and sort that too. Next up are the most important feature of any face, the eyes. Using the spot removal tool, I think I'm going to remove some of these tiny blood vessels. There are a number of reasons why people get bloodshot eyes. Um, a heavy night out, girls can accidentally poke themselves with the mascara brush, but in general, these are not a permanent fixture of somebody's facial features, so I do get rid of them. Next up, use the Vibrance Adjustment layer and bring down the saturation to negative 40. Invert the mask with Control i and then with a white brush tool, reveal the desaturated layer underneath to take some of the redness away from the whites of the eyes. This helps to add some good colour separation from the eyes and the surrounding eyelids. Now on my loop deck, I have a Photoshop action which I created called Curve Dodge. This creates a dodge layer which sets an upward curve adjustment. It inverts the layer mask for me and chooses the brush set to white. And all of this happens with one click on the loop deck which saves me some precious time. I also set the flow of the brush down to 7% using the dials. I also have the brush size and hardness set on the two other dials, which makes things super quick. So at 7% flow, I like to even things out on the eyeball and brighten things up gradually along the edge of the iris to create more pop and emphasize the roundness of the eyes. A quick before and after, and the same on the other eye. Now I said a few moments ago that I was going to bring back more shape to the nose. So on the same dodge layer, let's just brighten up where the highlights should be. And along the bridge of the nose. And that's looking better, but if we reference the original raw file we saved on the base layer, there is some highlight missing just on the tip. So if we create a mask over the retouched layer and choose a black brush, flow still at 7%, we can very gently blend back the original nose so it doesn't look quite so flat. And here's that before and after. Remaining on the dodge layer, some areas that benefit from a slight increase in exposure are the cheekbones, 
the chin bone, the cleft upper lip, and the brow. Subtle but effective. You don't want to go too far with this, that's why I keep the flow very low. Now it's time for the burn layer. Once again I have a shortcut action programmed into my loop deck which creates exactly the same adjustment layer and mask as the dodge but with the reverse curve to darken the skin. Areas for burning are the shadow side of the nose, under the cheekbones, and we can enhance the round shape of the forehead just by darkening the sides. A little darkening on the shadow side of the eye socket, and perhaps the neck is pulling focus away from the face somewhat. Now I've just noticed that there is some oversaturation happening on her neck here, so we can easily deal with that by going back to our vibrance adjustment layer, and with a white brush, flow still at 7%, start gently revealing the desaturated layer beneath. Sorted. The hairline is just distracting my eyes, so using the burn layer, Let's darken down that area. Now one more thing I like to do with the eyes is add some twinkle. First make a blank new layer, and with a soft white brush, flow back up to 100%. Let's draw a white line along the bottom of the pupil. Same on the other side. And you don't need to be too careful with going over the black area because we're going to change the blending option to overlay, which has no effect on the blackest parts of the image. And just bring the opacity of this layer down to somewhere in the region of about 20%. And that just adds a touch of sparkle. Now you may have dabbled with the liquify tool in Photoshop, and I'm just going to nudge a few areas like the lips and clothes and hair. So using my shortcut button on the console, this opens up the liquify window. Let's zoom in and nudge out the hair just at the top here. Tame down this little flick. Neaten up the line of the clothes and a very subtle tuck on the arm. Now you never want to take liquify too far, especially on skin, because A, you could offend your client, and B, there is the ethical argument. This tool should not be misused. Just a few tucks on distractions like the line of the clothes, and making the hair more voluminous. And that's all you need. Now one more thing I'm going to do is fill out the lipstick a touch. Now again, this is not to make the lips unnaturally bigger, but Lana actually missed some parts when applying, so we can remedy that. Just nudging up the cleft and leveling out the line to match the other side. And I think that looks nice and natural. However, I do think the colour could be more rouge for my liking. So opening up the hue saturation adjustment layer, using the eyedropper tool, we can sample an area of the lips, making sure the sample radius is around 5 by 5 pixels, which basically takes an average of 5 pixels around the eyedropper. And drag the hue slider all the way to the left, which allows us to see the selection. Then refine the adjustment so only the lips are this nasty green and then we can choose a colour we like. Around minus three, and darkening down by around minus four. And just to make doubly sure nothing around the eyes was affected, I'll invert the mask and paint back in the adjustment to the lip area only. So almost finished. One more thing I like to do is using a pre-programmed loop deck action called My Gradient Map, which simply adds a black and white linear gradient. I'll change the blending option of this layer to soft light, which when reducing the opacity has a lovely contrast effect. Around 12% works well, although some of you might want to push this further. And that's my final retouch completed. So there you have it, my portrait editing workflow from start to finish. Whew. So thanks for watching team, I hope you got something out of this video, I enjoyed making it. Um, don't forget to give us a like to help this little video along, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more photography content. I'll see you next time.